Shale gas is part of the future and we will make it happen. I was pushed into the person in front, lost my footing, fell down and was simply walked over by the ranks of police behind. Oh, yeah, I just saw feet coming towards me and I'm, I, yeah, a boot on the face. It's just facilitating our gas with little regard for our right to protest. They're following orders of corporations, basically. Yeah. 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 Now they're doing pain compliance. Get your fingers out of it. I'm charged with, without lawful authority or excuse, obstructing the highway, a free passage on the highway. Well, I believe I have lawful excuse, just because the gas and oil and coal in the soil shouldn't be allowed to invest in any new sources. We need to be investing in renewables now. And science is the same. Absolutely. This is not just fringe anarchists and extremists, this is going mainstream. <laughs> I run a local business which I've closed for the day to day. There are things that we can campaign against and lobby for, but when we're damaging our planet with irreversible action, that is just a sobering, sobering thought. Oh, no, no. Can you see what's happening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The government is going behind everybody's back and in league with the big rich company owners and it's all about money it's not even about gas the ground is just being pulled from under everybody's feet fairly quietly really exploitation of unconventional gas involves pumping millions of gallons of water sand and chemicals into the geology to fracture the rock and release the trapped gas no more than 40% of what is pumped down the well is actually recovered. Where the other 60% goes is neither predictable nor controllable. We, we, we have experience elsewhere. There is uh, plenty of number of hundreds of thousands of wells have been uh, drilled or fractured in other countries around the world. We've had onshore drilling in Britain for both oil and gas since the end of the First World War. Unconventional gas exploitation is a relatively new technology. It certainly has been around for less than two decades. So whilst on the conventional process, water and sand are pumped down to stimulate the well under relatively low pressures, for unconventional hydrocarbons extraction, the water, sand and a cocktail of chemicals are pumped under enormous pressure. We already have a system of regulation in place and I can assure you we're going to take very great care that there is no damage to the water supply and that there aren't risks involved in the fracturing before any of it's allowed to go ahead. The track record of the unconventional gas industry in the UK is somewhat less than impressive. Of course it started with the seismic events being triggered by Quadrilla at Priest Hall where they continued to frack even though they knew they had damaged the casing of the well. Then iGas at Barton Moss contaminated the well site. This really only came into the public domain after a series of uh, court hearings and the press restrictions were actually only lifted in early March of 2015. iGas and Peel Holdings are denying that they were responsible for these uh, chemical leaks, but without providing access for the independent expert to return to the site, then unfortunately uh, one can only assume that they have something to hide. 
Now, more recently, in East Yorkshire, Rathlin Energy were responsible for considerable property damage as a result of their seismic testing. Possibly the largest single piece of damage that has been uh, caused is that there is a fishing lake which started to go down immediately following the detonation of these charges began to fall by about two inches a day. Having been informed of this, Rathen Energy paid Yorkshire Water to allow water to go into that lake on a daily basis. The water coming from Yorkshire Water is going to be chlorinated? Chlorinated, yes. And you can only put so much of that into the lake before you will begin to have problems with the fish suffering from chlorination of the water and the business owner uh, has uh, potentially lost £1,000 a week in terms of revenue. And although initially Rathlin gave the business owner the impression that they would uh, rectify this because they absolutely accepted that they were responsible, they've now reneged on that and uh, have effectively forced the business owner to initiate legal proceedings. I think there's a huge amount of myths that are being put round in order to frighten people about shale gas extraction. Little baby Cameron, he's a child in my eyes, a very, a very spoilt, very spoilt, ignorant child. We can see in the United States it can be extracted safely and cleanly, providing effective, low-cost energy, green energy for our homes and for our businesses. Green energy for our homes and for our businesses. Green energy for our homes and for our businesses. Anyone that believes that the industry does not know the damage that they're going to do in the UK, even though it's a worldwide industry and it's been doing it for decades, you have to be delusional. Ian Crane went to Australia to meet the people who live in the heart of the gas fields. If we don't listen to their story, it will soon be our story. This facility, it is a central processing plant. There's one every 15 kilometres or thereabouts, and in between them there's three or four compressor stations. But there are thousands of kilometres of pipelines. I imagine by the time this facility is finished, they will have cleared as much land as is Great Britain. The devastation is horrific actually, because I, I live it, I watch it growing every day. If you go all the way back and you say the first person that signed a well was the person that doomed us to this. drive out from the Monk Ranch and the moment you get through the gate you're in the gas fields and on a grid that just goes on far beyond you could drive in a day every 750 meters or so there's a gas well and in between those gas wells are the pipelines and a grid that runs right across this part of the country. Brian Monk's ranch in Chinchilla, Queensland is surrounded by thousands of gas wells. When they came, they said, look, you know, all we want to do is drill a hole over there. It's an exploration hole. All there'll be is a pipe sticking out of the ground. And I said, but what about if you find gas? Because I'm figuring no one spends money drilling a hole if you don't think you're going to get gas. And they said, oh, well, all we'll do is hook a pipe onto it and we'll run it up to the current Roma to Brisbane natural gas, conventional natural gas pipeline, and we'll pump it into Brisbane. And you think, well, you know, that doesn't sound too bad. But of course, an unconventional gas well 
isn't a pipe out of the ground. With it comes all of the drilling and the destruction. That's a hectare forever. We're going to have 280,000 hectares plus tracks, compressor stations, water holding ponds, water evaporation ponds, even though they've got a nice fancy name now. They call them water transfer ponds. Evaporation ponds, which evaporate highly toxic chemicals into the air, have been banned due to public pressure. So QGC have simply changed the name to water transfer ponds. I guess it's true. You pump water into these huge big ponds and they transfer water into the sky. It's called evaporation, but they're not an evaporation pond anymore. In the UK, the Infrastructure Act, which passed into law in late February of 2015, effectively establishes a political definition of a hydraulic fracture. If less than 1,000 cubic metres of water is used on a single stage, or less than 10,000 cubic metres of water are used for the entire process, then it will not be regarded as a hydraulic fracture. So under this new definition, what occurred at Priest Hall would not actually be regarded as a hydraulic fracture. The reality is that a frack is a frack is a frack. Our projects, whether it's our domestic or our proposed LNG project, have a wide range of additional benefits whether it's direct or indirect employment, or simply just improving the vitality of the communities within which we operate. Okay, what we've got here is the power supply to the uh, Jordan and Kenya East field compressor stations. This is the start of 520 kilometres of pipeline, cleared like this. This destruction that you can see out in front of us is really just shifting power, water, and eventually gas. So we get power, water and gas, but we take a strip literally 520 kilometres for this one company. They've actually managed to get the Queensland government to put in power lines for them so that they can burn coal in a coal-fired power plant to power the gas processing facilities and RO. RO being reverse osmosis. So they're using Australian coal to drive the power, the RO plant, so that they're not using the gas that they're digging out of the ground <laughs> to, to power. So they get all the gas. And it's amazing because we get to burn the coal in, in Australia so that the gas can go overseas. It's a great plan and the profits go overseas. The natural gas resources are located here in Queensland. The gas fields are in Western Queensland and there the gas will be developed and produced and then an underground pipeline will take the gas 540 kilometres up to Gladstone where there are uh, big LNG trains being built on Curtis Island. The farmer on either side of this would never have been allowed to clear this country at all. But because they could, there would have been environmental legislation yep. that prevents the farmer from wanton destruction of the bush. Yeah. Remember at the start of this, I very strongly believed that my government knew what it was doing. And now I believe my government knows exactly what it's doing, but it's not doing anything for Australians or humans. And your government in Great Britain is going to do exactly the same thing to you if you let it. it it's the way it works. It, 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 People look at you and they say, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. No, I'm not. Have a look at this. If I'm a conspiracy theorist, tell me how come the farmers are not allowed to clear that land, but these bastards are allowed to clear anything and everything, and legislation is going through right now to allow them to take unlimited quantities of water. Any water they want, any time, any reason. And we sit on the Great Artesian Basin, one of the greatest water resources in the world, and they are allowed to deplete it and turn it to trash. The Great Artesian Basin is being depleted at a rate six times greater than it can be replenished. This is reminiscent, uh, in some ways, of the Halliburton loophole. 
yeah. where of course where the US oil and gas industry has the equivalent of diplomatic immunity in terms yeah. of what it wants to abstract in terms of water resources and then in terms of basically what it does with the waste. Yeah, exactly. This We have got the Halliburton loophole. I like to call it the Bly Robertson loophole. Bly was our Premier and and Robertson was the Minerals Minister and basically they changed the Water Act but it said the water and other and the and other was the Halliburton loophole. Ryan's water bore was contaminated by QGC in 2008. One day the grandchildren were in the bath and they started screaming and they had a red ring and everything that was in the water was burnt. We're treating your issue seriously and we're trying to investigate what the cause of the problem is. Yeah, I'm getting no gas measurements. Two different issues and one thing. Look at the all those vapours. Yeah, I'm getting no gas measurements. Have a look, it's a breezy day, you're not going to get any measurements up here. It's exactly the same as the bastards when they first sampled it. They sampled on a windy day and well away from the source. Every time they went near the source, they did this. So toxic to make our grandchildren unwell. So if you think the coal seam gas industry is safe, if you think it's regulated, if you think it's policed, look at the bubbles and have a listen to the machine. The circus has left town and now we're left with this. We check it with the meters just to make sure it's not leaking. When it's gone, when you are so scared of what's underneath the ground, you know, you're genuinely so scared of what is happening that even a lot of title holders, you know, around us and to the north in, in, in prime farming, I mean, they, they just don't trust the water anymore. And now farmers have found themselves almost becoming scientists to deal with the water, with what is going on. Whereas it was a, it was a given that your water under there was safe. You know, that's, it's a very interesting... Multiple generations have, have, have drawn from that same bore, you know. Um, and now it's, it, it's, it's untrustworthy and it's running out. Western Queensland, for example, is a, is a huge beef provider. And a farmer, when his dams get low to a point where it gets too boggy to safely have cattle near that water because he will lose his, his cattle, you, you will always have your bore plumbed into your troughs and the cattle have got a, a supply of water. If that water goes, it doesn't matter what that particular tidal holder for that particular period of time gets for that bore in a compensation, in a make good agreement, it's irrelevant because it's gone. It will never ever reappear. That, that grazing farmland is gone. When you're actually using a, a high pressure 42 inch pipeline to flow at those high rates 24 7. Yeah 2000 psi. That's when you see it like that unfortunately like they have in, in the United States and now it's Australia, next it will be the UK. Just imagine this industrialisation of your region and try and tell me that you're not going to be impacted health wise. Your food, your water, your air. You know, when we come out from Toowoomba now there's times when you can see the brown dome over the gas field. You drive out into a brown dome. Our rainwater tanks prove that the brown dome is raining down in, and settling on our roofs, raining into our rainwater tanks. The radioactivity is there, the heavy metals are there. If you can't trust rainwater, what are you meant to trust? So that's why you've got to stop it before it starts. You can't trust the rainwater out here. And people that don't realise that are in for a really sad future. So John, this is an example of um, 
the damage to your vehicle that has resulted just from rainfall. Just from the rainfall, came out one morning and it was as oily as, as you can see, it sort of got that oily look to it and just sort of thought, okay, that's pretty ordinary, but it was basically after I seen an interview on Origin up at the estate, they were talking about black rain and I sort of thought, ah, the Commodore, because it's it's been covered in that for a long time, but then when I walked out and seen all this, and I just thought, well, what's going on here? So at the end of the day, I took some samples off, sent it away, and the cadmium was seven and a half times vegetable growing level, which probably explains why the vegetable garden and everything died within days. Um, but they said, you know, we disregard that because you've done the samples. There is no guarantee that you, you know, how you did them. And I, it just bewildered me, you know, that nobody has come back. The, the government's been here, had a look. They walked in, had a look at the Commodore Evan and said, yes, that's that black rain and walked out you know they didn't want to do any testing and like i say to people it's just each time it rains it just comes up black like the monk ranch john jenkins property is surrounded by qgc gas wells we heard a bit of hoo-ha about the industry coming you know the odd sign appeared but we just thought you know like um we've got a bad mortgage that eventually they'll come here hopefully and we'll get a couple of wells you know like we weren't against the industry it was one of those things you know you sort of thought okay we might do all right out of this industry and within i don't know probably six months of them sneaking out of the scrub over the back we started getting coated with all sorts of crap um, and yeah, you just knew that you had to go the other way, you know, like, but when you start making complaints to the industry and they sort of come around and have a look and say, oh, there's nothing to see here, you know, you start to wonder. And then other people in town just said, well, John, you know, you're complaining for no reason type thing. And then, like I say, it took a little while before we could no longer drink the water. And we knew, you know, that we were in trouble then. It was just too late. So those people who do take the attitude of, she'll be right, mate. And she won't be right. I'm telling you, it won't be right. After, you know, like I said, we had that attitude early days and that lasted for probably, yeah, eight, the first 18 months the gas company were around us. And yeah, like I say now, the paint falling off the cars. This used to be a beautiful green lawn with roses in it. She won't be right. It will kill everything. In Queensland, we can develop our CSG to LNG project because we can do it safely, we can do it sustainably, and we can do it in a regulatory environment that's stable and predictable. We could drink our rainwater. You know, there wasn't a problem with it. It was beautiful water. And now, like, you, you can drink it. And I've got a health report from the Queensland Health that tells me it's perfectly safe to drink. Boil it for you because you might not be used to it. But at the end of the day, when you look out there and you see a dark green tank and the top of it is white and it's oily, that's not natural. We haven't drunk boil water for about 18 months. You just cannot drink the water. You know, um, even at the minute in the shower, it tastes that salty that um, I said to somebody the other day, I must try and freeze it again. Because last time I tried to freeze it, it took about two days, but it just blows up whatever you put it into. It's common local knowledge that workers in the gas industry do not drink local town water. Their drinking water is supplied. You buy it, you know, bottled water, and like I keep saying to people, that that's fine until they contaminate all the aquifers, then the people in the city will understand. When they can't buy uncontaminated bottled water, that, um, you know, we've asked, put in a request to the health department to supply water, but with that, I said um, I would like a copy of, you know, a radiation test to make sure that it's safe. And just no response. In the last, I think it's been about six weeks, haven't, he haven't heard back from it. Well, I guess the, the problem that the gas companies have is if the Queensland Health Authority acknowledges that the water's contaminated, then it points the finger at the gas company. So if they don't test it, then there's That's no right. blame. That's right, because the gas company is the ones topping up the river, which is topping up the town water supply. And so the easiest thing is just to ignore me because, you know, like you say, if they don't test, they don't find it. It's the same as when they came here, the government's came here and done testing on our water and they do a 13 metal sweep instead of an 84 metal sweep, mm. you know? And so like one of the two of the things they don't look for is aluminium and iron. And like I've got pictures of a Holliburton truck with a big aluminium bin on it. And it's clear here that uh, the politicians in this part of Queensland have, have effectively been totally bought out by the gas industry. Oh, 
had to have been, you know, because they, they just can't be that stupid. The fracking process that is used to extract coal seam gas uh, is made up of about 99% water and sand with some additives. These additives are things such as hydrochloric acid that you would see used in swimming pools uh, and uh, other materials such as disinfectants. Uh, these materials and uh, fluids and chemicals are not confidential or secret. The people still believe that the government will always do the right thing by you, you know, and I think they may do the right thing by some of the people some of the time, but they're not doing the right thing by all the people now, you know, it seems to be dollars over health. It doesn't matter which way you look at it, they need the dollars from the gas or the coal gas and they don't care about the health. For four years, the first four years we come here, we basically never bought any produce out of town. All the veg come out of the garden. Over, I think, about three nights of rain, it was dead. It's not as over in drought, like I've got sprinklers right around the yard. It doesn't matter. You can turn them on. There's a bush behind you there that was probably four foot high. Beautiful purple flowers on it one morning. Went out, thought, ah, oh, it's looking a bit dry today. Turned the sprinklers on, and within two hours it was dead. And then all the blue claw crayfish turned up dead around the dam. Like, this is probably one of the few places in Queensland that cane toads don't even live. Indestructible, people will tell you. And they've become an absolute pest oh, throughout yeah. Queensland. So even the cane toads, which seem to be able to live in almost any environment, will not survive here due to the contaminated water. Yep. Um, we had two or three mils of rain one night, and I come out and they were dead all around the lawn. $60 billion is being invested in these major developments in Queensland. That brings benefits not just on a national economy basis, but also into the local areas. And I can see, even as I travel through regional Queensland now, the revitalisation of some of those regional towns and cities. And it's a great thing to see. Who pay, who's paying for all these roads here, these, these nice blacktop roads? We know it was the government and the council they put bitumen sheeting on Montrose Road. And that was paid for under the uh, flood mitigation funding from the federal government. So the federal government paid to have a road done up and the road go is done up all the way to two compressor stations. Uh, Where the only traffic would be gas related. Yeah. This funding is basically coming from the royalties paid by the gas companies to the government, so the government then has the money to, to build the roads for the gas companies to drill the wells and remove the gas. Yeah. Over in, the, in America they've found that all of the royalties pooled together don't add up to the maintenance of the road. We've announced that uh, local communities will be able to keep all of the business rates. So there's a, strong, there's a strong interest here for local people and local communities that are affected by uh, the search for shale gas. And I hope all of these things will encourage that search to get underway now. The healthcare budgets of the states which host the extraction industry are growing exponentially. When you consider that the, they're sweeping the health impacts under the rug. They're doing bogus reports. They're lying basically at every level to try and minimize the health impacts. So out here, we see helicopters fly over for people that have got dizzy at work. They don't go onto the budget of this region because they're flown out of region into the capital cities. Just like the cancer clusters that are starting to pop up out here now, the health department is refusing to um, link them to the gas industry in any way, and yet they're residents that live near the gas industry who were perfectly healthy, and some of them have actually already died. And the health department and the Liberal National Party really tore strips out of the local member who brought it up and they just ridiculed him for even caring about his constituents. When I had a asthma induced heart attack when they were doing the pipeline next door, I end up at the Princess Alexander Hospital in Brisbane with at least five gas company workers in the beds next to me suffering the same conditions that I was. 
Um, but back as far as 2007, Aaron had a rash, really bad rash on him. Aaron is your disabled son? Yeah. We had all been going to the doctor with flu symptoms and it wasn't until years later that we heard people in the estate had the same symptoms as what we were having. That's when the penny dropped. To have them write any of our complaints down on the computers, they wouldn't do it. They were just as though we were just complaining for nothing. Even to get the doctors to do something about it, they won't do anything about it. They'll put our son on a six year waiting list to have his ears checked because he had blood coming out of his ears. I'd been across the road a couple of times and I just got so violently ill when I was over there. I didn't know there were a hundred wells out the back. I used to feed the ladies horses for her so she could escape the gas fields. <laughs> This is called a high point vent and there's tens of thousands of these in the country. They vent off any gas in the water to get rid of it. It's basically just waste disposal. They talk about how when you burn methane it's in theory better than burning coal. But when you don't burn methane it's 72 times worse than if we had a coal-fired power station here. So that'll have VTEX in it, that'll have everything in it. The benzene, the toluene, the ethyl benzene, yep. the, yep. the uh, xylenes, yep. everything. The group of chemicals that most people have expressed concern to me about are known as BTEX chemicals. The Queensland government has banned the use of these chemicals in Queensland uh, in this process. So these chemicals will not be used here in Queensland. Last night, the 14 flares that are, you know, basically around us are on for probably two hours and on the Geiger counter I think I got up to 42 microservients. Last night you were testing the, uh, the levels of gas in your son's bedroom. Yes. And uh, you were actually debating whether or not you actually needed to leave the house. Well, yeah, because you can come outside and it drops down, say, to, I get an 18 or 19 reading on the Geiger counter outside, where inside you're getting 35, you know, anywhere from 22 to 35. Max was 42, but, you know, um, for th over three hours we had more than 20 microservients inside, so... You know, um, I ring the department and oh, they will get back to you, they will get back to you and this has been going on for weeks since I sent them the last lot. When the Jenkins consulted their doctor about their son's health, they were advised to fit him with a gas mask. You know, like the taste in your mouth, it's just there, you know, and people sort of say, oh, but it can't be that bad, and you say, well, when your nose is burning, your eyes are burning, and you've got that terrible oily sort of taste, I said, you know, the flares are not, they're just venting. But I said, and then other times, I said, you just got the dry taste in your mouth, I said, you just want to go to sleep. And it's like little fibres in your throat, you know, the flare is on. It's not nice when you live day to day looking at wind direction. You get to the point where wind is scary and the still the stillness is scary. I mean, you live your life in a constant state of what is going on around us. One of the breaches that uh, Rathlin Energy were guilty of at West Newton was cold venting. One of the problems we have in the UK is that there is no requirement for infrared monitoring of the, the flares. So the way in which we knew that they were cold venting was because the protection community at West Newton and local residents, some up to a mile to a mile and a half away, suffered from incredibly strong odours. It, it got right into the houses. It was a very distressing, very strong odour. Um, that not only did they get into the houses, but that anything that they'd had outside, including their washing, 
was very, very uh, badly tainted. And in the UK, they're going to quote the CSIRO, which is a government department, used to have the highest reputation. But when they came out to test whether Australian gas fields were as leaky as uh, uh, the United States gas fields, they came out, they checked 43 wells. I went on their web page, 43 out of 10,000 on I went on their web page and I said, did you test any of these? No, they didn't. I said, did you test any compressor stations? No, they didn't. Did you test the ground? No, they didn't. What did you test? 43 gas wells, some of which had been concreted up, that were given to them by the gas companies. They did, didn't independently pick 43 out of 10,000 So gas. call it a hunch, but I would say that the gas companies didn't exactly pick 43 wells that they knew there was a problem with. Now I'm pretty sure there were no roaring gas wells that were leaking in that 43 that they tested. The people in, in both your country and in mine believe that this country has got a regulatory body looking over it. <laughs> but in fact, the regulatory body of the CSG compliance unit consists of two people for 10,000 gas wells. This is QGC, this is part of uh, BG Group. This is one of literally thousands of wells in, in this area. Yeah. This well pad will never be returned to its natural state ever until the coal seam gas industry is gone, if it ever is. In the US they just sell this lease to a smaller company to make a few bucks out of it for a little while. The little com company goes bankrupt and leaves the mess with the landowner and I believe yeah. that's exactly what's going to happen here because there's thousands of these. They'd be here for years trying to clean this up. Do you really and truly think a corporation wants to be responsible for this, this in 100 years time when, or 50 years time or 20 years time when that whole well casing completely rots away and there's gas gushing, gushing out of there if there's any gas left? And that's why they have the landowner sign for the liability. But it's not a gamble with the environment. It'll be very strictly regulated here. They will have to have proper permissions to protect the environment and to make sure that any drilling that's done is safe and does not uh, harm the local community. The reality is that neither the Health and Safety Executive nor the Environment Agency have sufficient resource or even sufficient expertise to monitor these operations as they are leading the public to believe that they will. In reality, the companies are simply required to send an end of week report to the Environment Agency and to the Health and Safety Executive, simply stating that everything's okay, nothing to worry about, keep moving along. There is no regulation. I mean, that is just, that's just words. That's spin, rubbish. Um, and now, that the evidence is becoming so obvious. I mean, a water bore that blows out water six feet into the air for 24 hours or more straight has been pressurized by contamination into the aquifer. Now, that same aquifer, I believe, was contaminated and damaged, and that started the, the gas bubbling into the Condamine River. And as they remove the water out of the coal seams, it is now just releasing the gas. And, and the gas is coming out of the ground here. So we are literally becoming poisoned by the gas through the ground on our own properties. There comes a point in time, a turning point, when no one can deny what's happening. And if our media outlets did anything at all, this would be national news. The, the fact that a river started bubbling a couple of years ago and has continued to bubble would, would raise alarm for anyone. It's the lifeblood of the communities and I see it. The water holes now they're fluorescent green or oily looking that you could almost walk across them, you know. But eventually all that is going to flow into that Murray Darling and contaminate, you know, right through. And I just, uh, uh, you know, it's mind boggling why people just don't get it. When the river started bubbling, 
no press, no one really picked it up. We actually had to struggle our way down quite a hard walk to get that bubbling Condamine River video out. And then the government then had to act. When they said, we're going to look into this, that's code for, we're going to get the gas company to fix this problem and shut it up. And they do that with money. In 2014, DEFRA commissioned a report to look at the impact of the unconventional gas industry on rural communities. After that report had not been released some six months after it had been commissioned, a freedom of information request revealed that the report had been heavily redacted. In fact, the report was eventually released with 63 sections removed, including the entire section on the impact that the industry would have on property prices in targeted areas. Suppression is the instrument of totalitarian dictatorships. We don't talk that sort of thing in a free country. <laughs> we simply take a democratic decision not to publish it. <laughs> Fine. And what am I supposed to say to the press and Parliament? Well, there is a well-established government procedure for suppressing, for deciding not to publish reports. Is there? Really? Of course. You simply discredit them. Good hell. One of the government ministers claimed that the DEFRA report should never have been commissioned in the first instance. She claimed that the report was not analytically robust and was not therefore signed off by ministers. That of course is political speak for it didn't say what we wanted it to say. Right in the middle of the Australian bush here. Well, it was once bush. Now it's a gas field. This was a dirt track. Now it's a major roadway with the pipelines running down alongside it. The land that's been cleared here is about 150 meters wide. More gas vents. And then across the road, another well site. You know, there's a lot of people around the world who are campaigning to save the Amazon forests. And yet, everything we've driven around for about the last three hours, not too many years ago, was just pristine bush. Now it's a, a grid of tarmac roads and these um, pipeline trails. I mean the amount of land that has been cleared of bush must run into hundreds of thousands of acres, if not millions. I, I would think so and but the thing when you look at it the amount of timber here like that's just wanton waste. What's going to you know, happen with it? Is it going to be burned or? Well I think so that's what they intend to do. It. Yeah. They were meant to mulch it, so what happens, a, a company comes in and they submit an environmental impact statement and they say, oh yes, look, we're going to um, mush up all of that timber that we cut down, turn it into mulch and we're going to put it over the ground. But then they say, well, we're not going to be able to deal with that timber, so we will just get an amendment. So the, the good public servants, if there's any, that approve the environmental authority, they say, based on the information you're giving me today, Yes, you can have authority. And then our good Premier, Campbell Newman, and his deputy, Jeff Seeney, they sign off on it, along with the rest of the Parliament. And, but before the ink is even dried, then the company comes along and says, well, we can't deal with that, and the water's going to be a problem, and this is going to be a problem. So then they start writing out their amendments. They would even be drafted before the environmental authority is released. So they're drafting <laughs> the, the amendments as the ink's drying and those amendments just get approved. If any private citizen were caught by a forestry officer they would be charged and they would have to go to court but there's no supervision of a D9 bulldozer that flattens everything and as you can see there's no argument that flattens everything in its path. Oh man I mean this is just unbelievable. 
Well, I've got that bitter taste in my mouth again. Yeah, and it's horrible. In the right weather conditions, we have that bitter taste 24 seven. The majority of people that have visited us, when they go home, they say, how can you live there? You know. That's what a lot of people don't understand, that it isn't that easy just to pack up and go somewhere else. I've been to the real estate and needed an evaluation and they won't even give me one because I presume that the price has gone that low that, you know, it, it, it'll be controversial to the gas company if they actually said, you know, so, and that's what I've found is that if you don't sell to the gas company, you don't sell to anybody. Our success is highly contingent upon that relationship with the community. And we plan to be in those communities for 30 or 40 years. And so listening to and tuning our programs to fit that is incredibly important. The first time we got the contract from QGC, we didn't sign. And with that, we were taken off the mailing list to Keras, Queensland. The CP lead done a report paid for by QGC to say what they sh the company should do to do the right thing by my son. And we've been taken off the mailing list there, you know, no contact. Very hard to get an OT or a physio from the hospital to call in here because, you know, there's a fair bit of corporate money floats around the hospital now and, you know, it's one way to divide and conquer. They're trying to get us to write away your health, you know, in the future. Mm. And I will not do that. $100,000 they offered us that we turned down. Living here and amongst this isn't worth $100,000 for the next 50 years. I'd hate to think what that equates to a day for four people. At times I have my son up two or three o'clock in the morning. The industry effectively silences any criticism as quickly as it possibly can, simply by buying the silence of those who have been affected. The neighbour across the road said she signed a contract for QGC. We could no longer go there, they no longer would come here. You need a confidentiality agreement at the front gate. It's like um, with you here, if I had to sign the contract, you can't um, talk about anything you've seen, felt, smelt or witnessed after you leave here. It's, you know, and you cannot complain to anybody, any government department, any anybody. And we've now even seen it in the UK with Rathian Energy offering compensation to people whose properties were damaged during the recent seismic testing, but that compensation reportedly only being paid provided a confidentiality agreement was signed and that the uh, house owner would no longer claim that the damage was actually caused as a result of Rathian Energy. The three projects in Queensland, and, and of course there is a, a fourth which is under evaluation, are some of the largest projects undertaken anywhere. And I don't mean just in the LNG industry, I mean anywhere. And it's made people so wealthy. Companies really, really wealthy. And they'll trot on anyone for that wealth. This is one of a number of prospective well sites in Gloucester, New South Wales. Uh, a big part of the uh, industry here is tourism and um, you know one really has to uh, wonder whether or not when this beautiful valley is uh, covered in well sites you have to wonder whether or not people are going to come here. Gloucester has still got its head in the sand. They really don't want to hear it. They're leading the good life. They don't want anyone to rock the boat. And as far as they are concerned, AGL are the good guys and we are the bad guys for creating the fuss. No? The, the police decided to go for a coffee break, so it um, doesn't look like the uh, truck's getting out of here until the, at least the police get back. So what's your name, sir? What's your name? Please refer all questions to AGL, thank you. Second? Please refer all questions to AGL. Protect the 
people, protect the people, protect the people, that is you and me. Protect the people, protect the people, protect the people, that is you and me. You guys been up, been up to Queensland? No. You say you haven't seen what this industry does I've seen, up there? I've seen on some of the films and yeah, I went to the information night at Foster. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty falling up there. Yeah, really. Yeah. Yeah, a lot different to here. At the moment. At the moment, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, yeah, I was actually saying to some of the guys yesterday, as we all know, this is just a pilot project and so it's not a production thing, but they're talking 110 wells up to yeah. 30 wells if it goes ahead in a few years' time. I don't want to be here then because, yeah, it probably will be something like you had at Bentley. Yeah, yeah, really. Well, I'm imagining yeah. that the protests would be a lot bigger if it gets to that stage. You better hope so. <laughs> well, I just don't want to be involved, you know, you know in this capacity, you know what I mean? Like if that happens, yeah. I don't want to be here for it. Because I don't enjoy doing this. You don't want to live in a gas field? <laughs> well, <laughs> come on, tell us! <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, we don't express to personal what, opinions. <laughs> when the tr real truth comes out about what this insidious disease is, you can't find out where the residue from the RO plant is going in Queensland. Once that land is destroyed, we cannot use that again to grow food or water. And basically, when it all comes to push and shove, food and water is all we need and it might be all we get. You know, well, we're leaving nothing for children. Before all this happened, you know, like I grew up thinking that, you know, the great Aussie way was looking after each other, mate. You know? And as I got older, mate, it's full of shit. You know what I mean? Like... You know, I grew up knowing that the farmers fed us, mate. You know, and that's whether it was beef or whether it was vegetables or, or whatever it was. But now, you know, this whole stuff about this, it's its just lining people's pockets, isn't it? If at this point in time you can stand in front of a, a, a drill rig and stop it from getting on, the easiest drill rig to stop's the first one. The hardest one will be the tenth, ten thousand. It'll be more than that though in the UK because you're doing shale over there predominantly. Shale needs a lot of wells, leads a lot of destruction, poisons a lot of water. If this gets the tiniest foothold, you know you're done. So it's now or it's never. Don't think that you've got that long because it's now or never. So you either, you do it now, you stand up now, and you find something within yourself that you didn't think was there. You know, that's the important thing. You will be confronted by police. They wear their Kevlar suits, and, and, and it's a big intimidation thing. And you've got nobody in front of you. Keep walking, you delay this way, you keep going. Don't push back on her, keep moving. Now, if you keep going. Keep moving, keep walking. It's up to the people of the UK to get their cameras in the face of the Kevlar security, the Kevlar police who are paid by the corporations. And we have to say, no, that's all it is. But it's more than just saying no at a meeting. It's intent, it's the intent of no, it's the knowing that you mean no. That's when you will be unbelievably powerful. You, you come out in numbers, if they see your grandmother and the mother and, the, and the, the child come out and say, we are not going to accept this, then they are finished. But that's what it takes. Don't sit back and think that anybody's looking out for you, it's you. The concerted efforts of everyday people across the country are stopping the fracking juggernaut in its tracks. Over the last two years, the anti-fracking community in the UK has grown to over 300 groups, and it is still growing. This is a topic that has brought people together in this country like nothing before. And it's having tremendous effect. Against all expectations, there has still not been a further hydraulic fracture of an unconventional well in the UK since the moratorium was lifted in December 2012. Since the middle part of 2014, the price of oil has been falling quite dramatically. This has had the effect 
of forcing the unconventional gas industry into hibernation. Despite the fact that the stock price of the likes of iGas are falling to the levels of junk stock, the UK government seems so determined to push ahead with this agenda. So one has to start asking the question, what is really behind this? Now, I can only conjecture at this juncture, but I would draw people's attention to the white paper produced by the British government last July, which discusses turning the UK into a toxic waste dump. Part of the agreement for getting EDF to build the new nuclear power plant at Hinkley Point in Somerset was that the UK would take the French nuclear waste and bury it somewhere in the depths of the UK. And the means by which they were going to dispose of this waste is through deep wells. Consider the possibility that uh, the industry was already looking at the potential revenue stream from selling off these wells to whomever it is that wants to get rid of this toxic waste. You've got to stop it at the start. We, we were asleep. We had an excuse. If you're, you're obviously watching me whinge to you now, you don't have an excuse. You don't have an excuse. I'm telling you what's going to happen. It's okay, you choose whether you're going to let it happen. But I'm telling you, and you're not going to want to live in a gas field. And remember, I have the added bonus of having 5,000 acres around me without a gas well. In 5,000 acres, you might have 100 landowners or 200 landowners, and you're going to have 100 gas wells. If this industry was to get underway in the UK, some 40 million people would potentially be living within one mile of a fracked gas well. And I'm telling you now, all of you people, whoever watches this video, you know now, it's the landowner that signs. If every landowner refuses to have gas on their property, there will never be gas on a property. Anyone hearing of a landowner who is being approached by the gas industry, then we need to try to make the effort to get in touch with them and to encourage them to do their own research. As Brian Monk says many times, it started with just one well. And so far, that's all we've had in the UK, just one well franked. Let's make sure it stays that way. Drill down beneath this town, no fracking way. The wheels are turning, can you hear that sound? No fracking way. They're gonna push poison into the ground, no fracking way. Will we let that happen while we're still around? No fracking way. Where there's no water left and there's none to drink No fracking way Is that when the suits will stop and think No fracking way Just how low can they stoop and sink No fracking way While Mother Earth quakes and there's the link No fracking way No fracking way, I said no fracking way I'm gonna drill down beneath this town I said no fracking way No one 
and asked us if it was okay. No fracking way. But they're making their plans come what may. No fracking way. They'll wipe us all out if they get their way. No fracking way. But we stand united and we say, No fracking way. No fracking way, I said, No fracking way. They're gonna drill down beneath this town, I said, No fracking way. They're gonna dig down beneath this town. No fracking way. The wheels are turning, can you hear that sound? No fracking way. They're gonna push poison into the ground. No fracking way. Will we let that happen while we're still around? No fracking way. No fracking way, I said. No fracking way. They're gonna drill down beneath this town. I said, no fracking way. No fracking way. I said, no fracking way. They're gonna push poison into the ground. I said, no fracking way.